Good evening, everybody. Am I, uh, I'm on, aren't I? You can hear me? Good, because I have something to say. The first thing I want to say is thank you very much for coming to this fourth in a series of five programs dealing with justice. And most, well, the first three programs we're dealing, as many of you know, who've been coming, dealing directly with criminal justice. And the one after this one will also deal with criminal justice. Today's program will see justice in a little different way. And you'll be about, you'll see it in just a few minutes. Uh, my name is Tom Morgan. I'm the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice, the primary sponsor of these programs. Uh, these programs are funded by, in part, by the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ivra Foundation, and the Mary C. Van Ivra Foundation Endowed Fund in memory of William Van Ivra, uh, former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received from the Royal D. Allworth Junior Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth the UMD Department of Foreign Languages and World Languages and Cultures, Reader Weekly of Duluth, and from numerous other private donors. And a special thank you from me personally and on behalf of the college to the Allworth family for supporting these, this, these programs very generously year after year. I'm very grateful for that. And if you want to do applause right now, applaud right now, I wouldn't object. <laughs> Now, um, other business, if you want to uh, get additional information or more information about upcoming programs uh, in this series, there's, there are sign-up sheets in the lobby. Uh, you can write your email and you'll get emails from me. Write your email nice and clear and crisp so I can understand it. And you can put your address if you like and then we'll send you, um, we'll, we'll send you postcards about upcoming programs. Uh, and there's a table out there, and I think it's the Hecua program here at St. Scholastica. You know, I'm not really sure. But there's a table out there you should visit. Uh, after the program, after this program, <clears throat> we'll have a talkback session, as we always do. And this uh, week's talkback session will be uh, led by Laura Wedge. You all should have these programs, or these little flyers that I hope we're given to you when you entered the auditorium. All the information about Laura and her credentials uh, are there, and the time and place, Thursday, 7 p.m. here at St. Scholastica, will be the talkback session where we talk back, talk about this. Laura will help us process what we all heard. After the presentation, which will be a little less than an hour, um, we'll have question and answer, people who have questions, and I hope you do. I hope you have lots of conversation from here. Come to these microphones in front of me, and our speaker, Jamie Harvey, will recognize you in turn. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and uh, one other thing, um, if students come forward and ask questions, and I'm certainly encouraging them to do that, then you community people, please defer to the students. Give them first shot at asking questions. I always think that's important. Uh, on the screens to my right and left, we are displaying the text of tonight's lecture through technology called real-time captioning. Although we anticipate a high-quality format, there will inevitably be errors that are inherent to the technology. A special thank you to the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation whose generous support makes this inclusive service possible. One more thing is if you have technology in your pocket or purse, now is a good time to turn it off and give your attention to the speaker, who uh, is the executive director of the Duluth-based Institute for a Sustainable Future. He's a Duluthian. He received a degree in civil engineering from McGill University and is nationally recognized for his extensive experience at the nexus of health, community, environment, and health care. He's been interviewed and cited in Time Magazine, USA Today, Minnesota, and National Public Radio 
among other media. Jamie Harvey led the successful coordination and passage of mercury product legislation and the phase out of healthcare mercury nationally. His work is recognized as helping support the passage of the United States Minamata Treaty, the global commitment to phase out mercury. Jamie served on the steering committee for the Green Guide for Healthcare, where he helped develop the healthcare sector's first quantifiable sustainable design construction and operations metrics. Jamie also founded and directed the Healthy Food and Healthcare Campaign and is credited with initiating the transformation of healthcare food policy and practice nationally to include the health of workers, community, and the planet. For his work in leadership bridging health and community, Jamie has been invited to be a part of the Creating Health Collaborative, an international group of health and healthcare leaders working to understand and create health beyond the lens of traditional approaches. In 2018, Jamie was selected as a fellow by the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, a national group devoted to building healthy equitable local economies underpinned by the regenerative capacity of the natural world around us. In 2009, he was awarded the Natural Resources Defense Council National Thought Leader Award for his work on sustainable food systems and healthcare. In 2013, along with Michelle Obama, he was included as one of the top 20 most influential food system leaders by Food Service Director Magazine. In 2015, he received the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Achievement Award from the Minnesota Public Health Association for his contributions to public health in Minnesota. Jamie serves on the board of the Psychedelic Research and Training Institute and the Food Commons and is president of the board of the Duluth Whole Foods Co-op. Locally, Jamie coordinated the Bagot campaign in Duluth to shift our mindset away from single-use plastics. He's offered trainings and presentations across the globe and consulted for clients, including the Blue-Green Alliance, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, City of San Francisco, World Health Organization, Chinese Environmental Protection Agency, and the Democracy Collaborative. His work has been published widely <clears throat> including in the uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review, in the textbook Integrative Medicine, and in the Democracy Collaborative Next System Project. His white paper on climate change and health was recently presented at the Vatican. Jamie lives in Duluth with his wife, Nancy Sudak, a physician, and their dog, Lucy. Their grown children, Nat and Emma, live elsewhere, but they seem to like visiting. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jamie Harvey. Oh yeah, I'm on. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, Tom. I, as, as I shared with uh, you about four or five months ago, you do such an incredible job of making your speakers feel honored, and, and it is a real gift. And you've done that for me, and I can only assume that that's how other speakers have felt as well. So thanks, thanks so much for that. I want to also thank, well, first uh, Tom, but also thank uh, President McDonald and the College of, of St. Scholastica, but as well, um, Royal and Karen Allworth and the Allworth Center for Peace and Justice for hosting this series and the series preceding this one. It's just an incredible asset. So thank you, thank you so much. It's a gift, true gift to the community. Um, and while I'm on the theme of gratitude, I'd love to thank my uh, love of my life, Nancy Sudak, uh, and for the gift of her being one of my rocks in, in, this, in this world. And she reminds me regularly that I'd be lost without her, and that's partially, partially, partially true. Um, <laughs> partially true. Um, though her words of wisdom today were really helpful to get out, get out into the woods um, and just say, you got this. Um, and it was beautiful being out in the woods today because um, it reminded me, it was a beautiful spring day, the sun was out, um, and it reminded me of, of 
my time growing up north of Montreal, where often this time of year my dad and I would uh, boil sap. Uh, we grew up in a small town called St. Sever, and the, there the, the hills look very similar to what Tedagoch looks like, or up near the border as you're heading into Canada, where the glaciers have just ripped the soil, and we call them mountains, or really rugged hills. And we'd sit there, we'd sit there in the spring this time of year, and the, the, the <clears throat> warm breezes would drift across the snow. My dad, who was a civil engineer, would tell stories. So he was a civil engineer that built structures and that sort of thing, but at the core, he was a storyteller. And that's how I learned, through his lens at least, how the world worked. And then while we were up there boiling sap, my mom would uh, be inside, and she was likely happy to have us out of the house. And um, she was this incredible, she was a, by profession a family therapist. Um, but she was this beautiful fabric artist as well. And so at the end of the day, we'd, we'd get back into the house and share the bowls of soup that she'd have cooking on the stove and, and reconnect. And so today it reminded me of that. And I was thinking about this as, as, as I was sort of thinking about this talk, um, how it's important to bring ancestors in the room. So in some ways, that's why I'm sharing that story, because I want to tell you about my ancestors. Um, but, but as well, because I see as some of the threads that they've given me, some of the gifts they, that they've given me. And, um, and those are how I think about structure and how I think about relationships and story, which is really going to be the theme of the presentation. And yes, I will bring this and tie it together around justice. And, and so, so thanks, Mom and Dad, wherever you may, may be floating. So let's do some context setting. So um, here we are in this world where we're finding phthalates, an industrial chemical at 20 feet below the Antarctic ice. We are liter literally bathing our newborns in a soup of chemicals, all with a whole known host of health impacts. Every one of us in this room carry, on average, 150 industrial chemicals. It's hard to make sense of that. We know that the world is filled with plastics. We're finding plastic particles in the St. Louis River. We're finding plastics in the fish off of Park Point. 20 million pounds of plastics are entering the Great Lakes every year. We're finding plastics coming from the rain in the Colorado mountains. And we're finding it in the snowpack of the Rocky Mountains and the Pyrenees. And we're finding plastic bags in the stomachs of whales. How do we make sense of this? Last year, the United Nations gave, issued a report that shared we're in the midst of global uh, uh, species collapse with the extensions accelerating rapidly. And of course, we sit in the middle of climate emergency, where the scientists are telling us that we have 12 years to figure out how we undo our civil society so that we can bring CO2 and methane and other climate emissions back into control. And so, what do we do with this? Right? And there's a clue that likely you're all feeling. And all these stories are connected. All these stories are connected. But the clues that you may be sensing are those because you're what you're feeling in your heart. So likely, if you were to measure the cortisol, those are stress levels in your body right now, you might, they might be a little elevated. Because these are existential threats. Right? And they motivate or flight or fright or freeze mechanism. But here you are stuck in your seats. Right? So at one level, what I want to do is just share that you're not alone in these feelings. And the feelings that you're having are completely natural. And they don't leave because these stories are in the news every time you go out, the, out, out into the world. But they offer us clues to think about um, how these issues are connected and maybe, maybe some pathways forward. And we have to remember that our feelings, we are motivated by our feelings, which come from our deep set belief systems. And these feelings connect all of these issues beyond climate change, obesity, ozone depletion, all the big existential issues I would offer. And they're connected to our story. 
our dominant narrative. What do I mean by story? It's our way of making sense of the world. So when you're sitting in the workroom, in your classroom, in your dorm, and you're swapping stories or gossiping, what you're doing is you're making sense. And it's a mixture of what you see and your belief systems. And that's our way of making sense. And the belief system, the dominant belief system, or our dominant story, really, is, uh, and there are many, are, um, uh, but the dominant one for this culture is, and most of the Western world, is that the world acts like a machine. So when you think back 300 years or so when this country had formed, it was during the Enlightenment followed by the Industrial Revolution, and we truly believed in, in rational thought, in scientific reasoning, in cause and effect, and utmost predictability. And what we believed then, we believe now. And it's deeply woven into our, into our judicial system, our education system, our food system, our medical system. So if we believe that people can be owned and land can be owned as we did back then, it should be no surprise that those with the, healthy, with, with the highest health disparities in the healthcare system are those whose land and labor and land were taken from them. And it should be no surprise that they fill up our, edu uh, our, our uh, prison systems. And it should be no surprise at all that we're in the midst of an existential crisis of ecological collapse. So what we have, we're in the midst, right? So the challenge is that we're in the midst of this great shifting from a story that has kept this country and made it very powerful over the last 300 years. And it's worked for many people, not all. And it's becoming undone. And so we're moving from a model of racial hierarchy a world of race on the left to a movie uh, to, 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 to the right where you see shared humanity. A world from duality of he and she to a world of they. To a world where there's someone in charge, to a world where no one's in charge. And so we're in the great shift. And part of the tension and stress that I think we're likely feeling is that we're moving between two stories and we don't know which one to believe. So let's take a little walk outside. Let's take a little walk outside. It can be on your dorm room balcony. It can be in those beautiful woods behind the college or Leicester Park where I am. And we start to see life all around us. Right? We can call it nature. And that we know that flocking birds, their survival and their health is based on their social connections. And actually, researchers have mapped these 300 million mappings of their social connections of flocking birds. And their social connections are directly related to their health, whether they, they get, they get um, infections or disease or find food. And it's the same that we find in the human family. So that we know that those that have a heart attack are more likely to die if they don't have, after that event, if they don't have social connections. Your social connections tell you, can tell you whether you're gonna have the flu, um, have, have, I'm sorry, the, can, we, can we bring the house lights down? Thank you or whether, whether we're going to be impacted by the, the flu, the severity of the flu. Our social connections matter, matter. We're wired for connections. And we see that out in the natural world. We see that in the human world. We know that out when you're walking in the woods, that all the insects are moving and the scents and the smells and the flowers that are all around us, that flowers should actually detect the electromagnetic vibration of bumblebees and change the content of the nectar in the flowers. We know that slime rays, these are single-celled organisms, amoebas, right, that have no brain, no nervous system. And I don't know how and why they did this, but research, researchers have discovered that slime molds like oatmeal. And so you can put oatmeal in a maze with all these dead ends, and the slime mold will move its way through in the shortest direction through the maze. And slime molds don't like salt. Yet if you put oatmeal on the other side, thank you, 
uh, oatmeal on the other side of a row of salt, the slime mold will send a tentacle out through the salt and learn and become habituated and move its way through a substance that it really doesn't like. And when it merges with another amoeba, right. it can teach and train that um, teach and train that other slime mold when it does this mer merging. So how is it that something that seems so simple is actually able to habituate itself and learn? There's so much out there that's alive and moving that we don't even know about. We know that research shows that rooms with a view, if you have a room with a view in a hospital, this is a healthcare system in Germany, that you actually heal faster and have fewer complications. Wow, what's with that? And of course, there is the nature prescription. Some of you may have heard of that, where if you have two hours a week or more in nature, you have improved well-being. And frankly, the idea of medicalizing what should be a natural time in the, in the, in the natural world um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But there is something that is going on, something deep in our DNA. And then there is a therapeutic effect. This very interesting research done in the Journal of Family Medicine, right. where, they, where they swabbed volunteers with a common cold. And they, um, they assigned these volunteers to just stay home, to go to a physician who had been trained by actors to be extremely empathetic, and another set who had been trained to be cold-hearted and mean. Right. And so and you can actually, there's nothing you can really do with the common cold except go back and rest. But those who were treated by an empathetic clinician had fewer symptoms and recovered faster. And those who saw sort of the mean clinician actually took the longest right, to heal. So it's better to not go to a mean doctor. <laughs> and we're talking about the common cold. And most physicians would say, you shouldn't even go to see me if you have got, got the common cold. But what is going on? Right? We know that our hearts give off electromagnetic radiation. What is, what is happening in that space between us, this relationship that in connection is happening? We know that soil microbes, when you play in soil, they move from the soil into your gut and through up into the vagus, through up the vagus nerve and impact your emotions. Right? So soil is impacting how we feel, that there's this deep connection, this relationship that's happening. And of course, some of you may have read the overstory, or I think there's a movie now, around how trees have created these networks, these mycorrhizal root systems. Right, that are moving nutrients through the forest. So if you're walking in this forest out behind us, you're walking through a whole communication system where trees are shunting food and nutrients from one to another, from hardwoods to conifers and back and forth. It is fully alive. And that trees and plants, when they're attacked by pests, send off chemicals and signal and communicate to their brothers and sisters, if you will, that they have been attacked and these signals, these chemical signals, get the plants to curl up their leaves or create noxious substances in their, in their uh, create noxious, nox, noxious substances so that they can avoid these pests or repel them. So when you go out into the forest or even on your balcony, all around you, there's this whole huge web of connection, relationships and feedback loops that are sensing the smells and the feelings and the, and, and the energies that are moving all around. It's this incredible diverse web of life that's not only happening in this forest, but expanding into northern Minnesota, throughout Minnesota, throughout Minnesota through this country, and across the whole planet. It is what we call life. Right? It's what we call life. And so it's interesting when you think about these incredible, this incredible network of which we as nature are humans, our nature, are just one part, when we start to think about stewardship, and my guess is the College of St. Scholastica, actually I know because I was speaking with President McDonald beforehand, that it's one of the values. But the idea of stewardship is woven into probably every, uh, the value system of every uh, institution of higher learning in every healthcare system. But, but, if the soil microbes are changing our moods and emotions, who is stewarding who? Right? If climate change is now telling us 
as a city wherein how we should build our homes or invest in our money, who is stewarding who? Or if climate change is changed in the minds of Australians in a similar way right, because of the recent fires, who is stewarding who? Maybe we're stewarding one another. Maybe we're stewarding one another. And my sense is that deep down there is something bigger that is calling us to the natural world and calling us to be part of this life. Um, and so that we can be fully alive humans on a living planet. And if that doesn't really work for you, there's actually science out there that tells us that it is so. Right? There's a branch of science called complexity science. And, and it looks at, um, at um, interwoven relationships and, this is, and we humans and all life itself are what are called complex adaptive systems. And they exhibit these six characteristics. Emergent behavior, which means there's spontaneous order, that there's nonlinear tipping points, that suddenly something will happen. And if we've ever been in a crowd where suddenly a, you feel the flow of energy changing in the, in the, in the room and, and things happen, you can think about the financial crisis a couple of years ago, that suddenly that seems unpredictable. And complex adaptive systems have limited predict predictability, and small changes can create large, large events. But that all living systems, including humans, exhibit this characteristic of uh, self-organization, and that they're evolutionary dynamic. And what that means is that all of life is moving and ebbing and flowing, that there's a vibrancy. We're not things, right? We're all in relationship with one another. And so, the idea of complex adaptive systems is that each is a part of the, each is a, from the microcosm to the macrocosm, it is all connected. So whether we're cells, a group of cells that make up an organ or make up the human body or our households, right? If you're sharing a dorm room, you are a complex adaptive system. You somehow self-organize. Who's doing the dishes tonight? Who's doing what? Right? Or if you set up a camping, camping site in the boundary water, Somehow it self-organizes. If you're a group of ants, right, and you make yourself a home, that's self-organization. So life is always ebbing and flowing and part of a whole large system from the microcosm to the macrocosm. So whether it's science or whether it's just a sensing that you have out there, we are in the midst of what is often called the great transition or the great turning. We are, our story, our story of a, whether you think of ourselves as a complex adaptive system, right, or a living being on the living planet, we are in the midst of our old story reconnecting with the old. And it's a very difficult thing because we humans, right, we love predictability. Right? We want to know that there's certainty. And so we want the sense of security with that. We want the rules and we want structures and we often want somebody in charge. So it's no surprise when you look out in the world that there are those that's seeking those rules and the authority. So this is part of the undoing, the restoring that we're all part of. And the, the new story creates a shift in perception. We start seeing the language of moving from parts to whole, from objects to relationships, from objective knowledge to contextual knowledge, right? moving from quantity to quality. All of these things. Robin Kimmerer, the indigenous scientist, she's an ecologist and the most beautiful and gifted writer, has this book called Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if any of you have read it, but there's this chapter where she describes how the English language is filled with words that describe life, but they're all nouns. Right? And in her indigenous language, the words that describe a tree, a bird, a bay, and so forth, they're all verbs. So the word bay is really like being a bay. You have a sense of the dynamic, mm, dynamicness of all life, and the language is embedded deep into Whereas we, they're all, they're all nouns. So in this great transition, we're starting to see the shift in this movement. Um, and, and people are starting to create models out of whole cloth and others are working within the systems to ch change them within. And the NUCA system of care, and I do a lot of work within the healthcare space, is this incredible example of an indigenous created new model right, that works 
from a holistic model of health, which means that mind, body, and spirit are seen as one, and that health cannot be separated from the individual, the community, and the planet. And this model has dramatically transformed health outcomes uh, for the community uh, uh, in South Central Alaska. And, and people are moving to learn the model from across the globe. The Institutes of Healthcare Improvement calls it one of the most far-reaching and most innovative models in the world. And if you ask them, if they had to distill everything down to what they do, what they would say is like, we focus on relationships. We focus on relationships. That is the language and that's the model of the new world. And of course here in, the, in, the, the, in our typical healthcare system, which you have to understand the biomedical model or Western medicine is a biomedical, it's a mechanistic model, which was built on the idea of the body as a machine. And clearly, that has changed in the last 50 or 60 years or so. But the, the mindset, the mindset still, still holds. Yet at the same time, we're seeing across the country, um, in, these West, in, in our healthcare system, the, the development of integrative health centers. And it's a whole different mindset. So you have two, two operating systems going in at the, on at the same time. So a top-down mechanistic model, right, and a holistic whole person a model uh, bubbling from, from the bottom up. And, um, and at the same time, many of these health systems are developing ecological health mission statements. So they're operating in the old way, right? but they're also creating an umbrella and a value system which, which recognizes that the health of the individual and the community and the planet are, in, are interrelated. So we see, for example, Gunderson Lutheran, the hospital system in La Crosse, Wisconsin, has addressed climate change because they recognize that, that in the environment or climate and individual health are intimately connected. So Gunderson Lutheran has removed, has, is now uh, uh, carbon neutral. We see the Aurora Health System uh, uh, in, in Wisconsin has declared a climate neutrality goal. We see Dignity Health, it's, it's actually a different name now, but it's one of the largest Catholic health systems in the country, has divested from coal. So you're starting to see these shifts from, from within. And the movement, this is part of the whole great transition, moving from a model, a mechanistic model, into a holistic model. And in Boston, which was after Hurricane Sandy, almost lost five of their six hospitals because they're built at sea level, the healthcare system said, hmm, how do we think about our, the community of Boston as a whole? and the health of the community as a whole. And what they've done is the healthcare systems called on the city of Boston and said, we have to work together in this. And they called on higher ed, and they called on the hotels, and, and, and they called on civil society. And they've created the Green Ribbon Commission with the works on climate reduction from an equity lens. And they've created this carbon-free Boston model. And it's an incredible model, which you know, we could do that in Duluth, we could do it in many other cities. But again, the idea is how do we co-lead co and work together to create the models for the future? And one of the really exciting and important threads in this conversation, I think, is the whole rights of nature movement. And it was um, really catalyzed by uh, professor, law professor Christopher Stone uh, from Southern California in I think it was around 1972, and it was interesting. I don't know if you read the book, The Lorax. I don't know if people have read The Lorax of the Child, right? Um, but who will save the trees? His argument is that the trees can actually speak for themselves, and actually rivers can speak for themselves. And all e and whole ecosystems can speak for themselves. And his argument was that, that the, uh, it's a natural evolution of giving personhood, or standing, standing, right, in, in, the, in the legal sense, um, is the ability to sort of demonstrate that you have a horse in the race or that, that you will suffer harm. And is to prevent frivolous lawsuits as a judge made rule. But that the tree should indeed have standing or ecosystems. And it's an evolution from those who had formerly never had personhood. So, for example, married women or African Americans. Right? And in fact, in, in, the, in the legal sense, there are many non persons. That have, that have rights, estates, and ships, and corporations. So it's a natural evolution of, of, of thinking and, and thought. 
But, um, but the idea is that they should have standing. And some might say, well, well, yes, but don't we have you know, the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, which clearly have done incredible, an incredible job at, in this country cleaning up the environment. So we don't have the Cuyahoga River in, in Ohio, in Cleveland on fire, or my understanding of the St. Louis River was pretty nasty in its time. But the problem with these pieces of federal le legislation is that it embeds the right to pollute in the law. And so it gives the landowner or the property owner the right to law. It's as though one could give the, a, a workplace the right to discriminate just a little bit. Right? It's an absurd on its face. And what the book has done is actually catalyzed this whole movement. And in 2006, a uh, small town in Pennsylvania um, used the rights of nature doctrine to prevent the disposal of toxic sludge in its community. And the rights of nature movement has moved uh, acro really across the globe. So rights of nature included in the Constitution of Ecuador and Bolivia and in New Zealand, parkland or now a river was, get, was, give, uh, was granted the rights of nature. In Colombia, the Colombian Amazon was given the rights of nature. It's embedded into the Green Party of Scotland. And so it's, it's really transforming, uh, really transforming uh, legal thought and legal doctrine across the country and across the globe. And one of the more recent ones that some of you may have heard is the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, which in 2009, the citizens of Toledo, Ohio, were just fed up with the agricultural runoff coming into Lake Erie because the fertilizer would um, create a hypoxic situation, fish would die, algae blooms would grow, and it stunk and the fish were dead, and they said, enough. And so they passed, by a margin of 60%, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, which gave Lake Erie the right to exist, flourish, and evolve. And not surprisingly, the agricultural interests and ultimately the state of Ohio sued and said, this, this can't happen, and was defended by the city of Toledo. And the arguments that were presented, well, what does it mean to exist, flourish, and evolve? That's too ambiguous. But one has to ask, what does the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness mean? That is somewhat ambiguous in itself. No. And they also asked how, how the lake could even be represented in court, recognizing that, not forgetting that courts, courts often weigh competing, competing rights. So the state of Ohio argued that their right to manage the water resources, some would say pollute, was being taken away when courts often weigh competing rights. And just this last Friday, a federal judge ruled that um, it was actually too ambiguous. And so it's unclear to me right now where this is going, but it hasn't stopped the global movement around the rights of nature. But I caution people who get excited as this might be the last great hope. Because we know that, for example, in, in 1917, um, the suffragettes were, uh, Dorothy Day and the suffragettes were, were beaten, tortured, and jailed, right? Protesting in front of the White House for the rights to vote. And the journey of reconciliation, freedom writers in the 60s were fighting segregation laws in the South, similarly beaten, jailed, and tortured, and killed. So, so laws are one thing, but it's in the mindset and the hearts, I think, is where the difference lies. But there's a tension that is going to be happening, and we see that happening already. So whether it's, whether it's from Standing Rock or the Canadians who have been protesting their heredity, the rights of hereditary chiefs in, in Vancouver, what's us, so it can try to, to, uh, to reject a pipeline or choose a route, where citizens of Canada are stopping blocking railways, or the Greta's or the, or the young climate activists who might soon be jailed, right? One has to think about what side of history, if you are a judge or a future judge or a lawyer or a future lawyer, what side you want to be on. Because right now, states are putting in five-year felony uh, 
making it a felony, a five-year felony, and a $10,000 fine for simply trespassing. So again, we have society, civil society, sort of feeling a little bit concerned that things might be getting under control, out of control in the same way that they're, 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 they're pushing the old, the old paradigm way of thinking in the same way that those advocating for the women, women and for the right to vote or African Americans to be treated like a human. So one wonders what things will look like 30 years from now when we look back. So, so when Tom asked me, and we were sort of discussing whether I'd be interested in, in doing this talk, I said, Tom, I just, justice isn't what I do. Like, I can talk about environmental justice or climate justice, but you don't want this white, old white guy sitting up here talking about environmental justice. But uh, we, we, we talked back and forth. There's, I'll admit that there was sort of a thread. There was something, a bigger, bigger calling that was, um, that, was, that was pulling me towards this. But at the core of it, it was like, what is justice? Justice for who? Right? Justice for who? And in what time frame? And I think ultimately for me, what I started to realize is that it's just this crazy, it's this crazy man-made, very crude way of, 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 of creating wholeness and healing. And if any of you heard the presentation two weeks ago by Laurel, uh, Laura Rizelton, uh, I heard these same words her, her work has been um, pulling people out of the criminal justice system who've been wrongly accused, because that's a large part of work. And all I heard, all I heard was the work, was the need for healing and restoration, the, re the need for restoring relationship. And so Obama has used the phrase right, that the, President Obama, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, borrowing from Martin Luther King who actually borrowed from a uh, Unitarian minister 150 years ago. And the way I think of it really is that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it manifests healing and wholeness. Right? And so at the core of our universe, and whether we think of ourselves a complex adaptive system, we're just one part of a whole, all seeking healing at the individual and at the whole level. And so manifesting the sacred, it's this incredible beauty, the recognition and celebration that we're all inextricably, inextricably connected to each other by force that's greater than all of us, that there's something bigger, there's something bigger beyond us. And so, so the idea isn't that we think about the planet as a self-correcting system, a self-balancing system as it, as it is, right? a complex adaptive system. We don't know, we don't know if in the next week or the next day or the next year the Gulf Stream will suddenly reverse as it's predicted to do and the Gulf Stream heats all of North, Northern Europe. We don't know if that's going to happen. Or we don't, it could be equally likely that students across the globe suddenly stand up and say enough to fossil fuels. Right? So our challenge is, is really thinking about what our role is as people on this beautiful planet. And, and at the core is reconciling the fact that our old story does not fit, does not fit with what it means to be alive on a living planet. Right? The idea of, of us as a machine, as a commodity, or we as a people as part of a beautiful, beautiful whole that is connected in ways that it's hard to understand. And so really the work that we're doing, whether it's in a climate emergency or all the work they're doing, it's not really the destination. For me, it's not about saving the lake, or it's not about banning plastic, it's not about adopting rights of nature, right? But it's the journey, it's a journey along the way, it's a conversation that we start. And as long as we embrace the sacred and we manifest our innate and collective wholeness, that's the job that we're doing. It's about restoring relationship between one another and all of life. That's the beauty of it all. And so, so what do we do with that? Right? So what do we do with that? And a couple of years ago, I was, um, it was about 10 years or so ago, I came across this term, the gifts of nature, and I never heard about that. And the gifts of nature was describing the gifts of nature, right? 
or food or air or water that we just take for granted. And there was something that was so beautiful about the word gifts of nature that there was sort of a, a sacredness in it. Like in, it was in, in, in embodied in there was a sense of deep relationship. And, and I really uh, was struck by that. And I imagined what would the DNR right, be if it, instead of the Department of Natural Resources, if it was called instead the Trustees for the Gifts of Nature? <laughs> I think it would operate a little differently that there would be a reverence, that there would be a reverence that somehow we've lost. So how do we honor these gifts, these gifts that we've been given? And it began, began to kind of eat at me. It was a curiosity. And a year or so ago, we were, my wife and I, we were walking to Lester Park uh, with our friend and, who was having some troubles in her marriage. And she was sharing how her therapist had asked her uh, and her husband um, if they, what their love language was. And she said, love language? And he said, yeah, there's a book out there called The Language of Love. And it turns out it's, you know, five million copies or so have been sold around the country and everybody knows about it but Kath, um, this friend and myself. <laughs> but at the core of it, it's about honoring the relationship. And we do it in different ways. Sometimes we speak little words, right? Others, it's a physical gesture rubbing a back, rubbing a foot. It can be leaving notes. And what it is, it's a form of gratitude. Right? You're not asking for anything in return. Right? It's honoring the relationship that you have in the way that you do, that you figure it out. And there's a beauty in that. And so I realized, I realized that when I'm out in the park, as I am every day with my dog, is that, that I'm saying words in my head saying hello to the trees. And so I just started doing it verbally and just saying hello. And instead of walking past, I would just, just stop doing it. And it really trans started to transform me in ways that um, are, are um, sort of hard to describe. And, um, and I'd offer that it might be something that all of us in this room might just try, even if it's sitting on their balcony, maybe it's in the woods outside. It might be with a friend because your friends, right? Other human beings are gifts of nature. And that you just sit there and, and, and listen, not with your ears, but listen to your hearts. Right? And ask, what is that gift, right? What is that gift that you're giving me that I'm feeling, that I'm sensing? And if you do this for a week, the first day or two, it might feel a little silly some friends might see you sitting by a tree or a plant. Or, but something will transform. Something will transform you. And what's really happening is that gratitude changes us, changes our minds. And the uh, Buddhist and eco-psychologist Joanna Macy, and if you ever have a chance to read some of her writings, describes gratitude as radical. Because what it does is it quietens, quietens the frantic mind and brings us back to source, opening our hearts and reconnecting with life. And so, so gratitude is, is changing our minds. And neuroscientists will say that if that's what you do. You focus on, put your attention on one thing and you can actually change your neural pathways. So it's, it's a start. It's one of the strategies to reconnect us with all of life. Now, I've uh, recently had the opportunity to become part of this uh, Psychedelic Research and Training Institute. And the works in the psychiatric field around psychedelics is transforming the world of psychiatric medicine. Because what it's doing is opening up incredible new ways of treating um, diseases that um, have never, have, uh, are just suddenly coming to light. And psilocybin, or magic mushrooms, as they've been called, are very powerful plant medicine. And what, what the world of psychedelic medicine is, is noticing is that, um, is that there's something about the psychedelics. And, and in experiments in the UK, at the Royal College, they have given psilocybin to those with treatment-resistant depression. And those patients, after one week, after six months, after one year, after two years, their depression is gone. It's gone. 
treatment-resistant depression. But also, there's all these scales are measuring this, that the, the depth of the psychedelic experience is what they call ego dilution, uh, dissolution, um, is directly related to the decreased authoritarianism. So they actually measure people's mindset right, on the spectrum. So decreased authoritarianism, increased ego dissolution, and increased nature relatedness. So there is something going on. And what they've discovered is that there is a processing center in the brain called the default mode network. And what the default mode network does is kind of like our ego. And what it does is it, it is kind of, it's always active. So if we're sitting here right now, right now it's working in all of us, this default mode network. And what it's doing is it's gating out all these senses, the smells, the scents. And what it's essentially doing, if, if they were wide open, we'd be bombarded by colors and sounds and everything, and life would be, frankly, a little crazy. But what it's also doing is creating a sense of self. So in a way, it's sort of our ego processing center. And when you're under psychedelics, right, these gates open wide open, and which is why when these uh, experiences, psychedelic experiences described, you're seeing colors and sounds, but you're also removed. And on the left is, is uh, a normal brain, on the right is uh, MRI imaging of someone under uh, psilocybin a dose of psilocybin. So the neural networks are wide open. Right? So it's these gating mechanisms. There's something in that that's, that sort of, that when we're under the drug, we move away from ourselves, our ego d dissolves, and we're, our minds open up. And that is life changing, it changes our mind. And these images are what you also see when you're under, uh, for experienced meditators, you see the same thing. And so there's something called the um, uh, overview effect, which they've noticed in astronauts. And in astronauts, the same thing happens, that you create this whole sense of awe and that their minds are literally changed once they come back to Earth. And there's something that happens again where you see yourself as small, your ego dissolves, this time from going into space. So there's something around the space of ego and self and if you remember that image that I showed back and forth, there's something there in that special movement, that transition from a story. So the question is, how do we move our collective story forward? And so gratitude may be one way of doing it. But I don't think, I don't think we need to go to the moon to start changing our minds. I do believe that the plants are calling us. I do believe that the planet is calling us to reconnect with all life. I truly do. And I believe it's also by opening up our gates and not putting up walls. Right? And it's about opening our hearts and minds. And somehow, if we're able to do that, we'll find what I think of is a reconnection with all life and some people might call it justice. So thank you. down here and hold his feet to the fire and ask him good questions. Please. They gave a couple of you some stock questions. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Carl. walk outside your door and enter into the woods. What happens when communities are devoid of woods, of green space, of communities that lack those opportunities to connect with nature? So, thank you for that and bringing that to light. Um, like clearly, clearly, um, we do not have a world that's equitable. Um, in, in that experience, right, in that, ex you, know, it, it, you open the door to a much, bigger need for community change. But if we're looking for moving towards gratitude, we can do that with one another. We can do it with a house plant if you're using the idea of an experience, right? There are birds everywhere. There are birds everywhere. 
Um, but I, I, I think, and I, uh, knowing you, I know you're kind of teasing me a, b a little bit more deeply about the incredible disparities that exist in many of our cities around access to nature. And, um, and, um, and I think this work is longer time, like a, a, long, a longer job. Um, and and um, one of my mentors is Dr. Gail Christopher. Who is who is who developed uh, the truth and racial healing and transformation work? And her work in communities across the country has been really powerful. And what she does and the model that she uses really around neuro neuro um, changing our neural pathways. And it's these aren't conversations about race, right? but they're actually bringing people together of different different people um, in racial healing circles. And bringing them deeper and deeper into the heart space. And once you do that, what you do is you see your shared humanity, right? So it's not about tolerance. It's not about discussion about race. It's about seeing our shared humanity, and changing our neural pathways. And that may seem long and slow, uh, but that wor this work, I think, is fundamental. It's about moving, working at our heart level, and um, I think that's how we start to um, improve uh, the access to nature for all, so it's available. Yeah, thank you for the question. More questions? <clears throat> and <clears throat> as you're walking down the stairs, <laughs> as you're walking down the stairs, I did want to, um, there was an oversight in what I shared, and that there's some really incredible work going on in Duluth. Um, uh, right now around the rights of nature um, and exploring the idea of bringing the rights of nature and declaring the St. Louis River uh, as having with the right to flourish and exist. And I see Nicolette and Laura in the room who are, are doing some really good work on that. And they'll probably be up in, uh, up in the reception area later. Yeah, it's almost like you have to eat it. It's kind of a goofy yeah. feeling. Right? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, okay. I did, first of all, I wanted to say that I think I got some minor whiplash from nodding so vigorously throughout your whole talk. <laughs> um, and I appreciate it. But you, you, I think you were hinting at a connection, something I hadn't thought of. I was a lobbyist for 30 years. So I really think that you know campaign finance reform is something that we really need very badly. And one of the reasons I think so is because corporations, I think, have too much influence over our political structures. And you hinted at a different way of looking at that that really has me, I don't know if I made it, if I was imagining it, but I think you were hinting that we could actually use that kind of thing to our advantage when you were talking about lakes being considered to be almost like people or entities that have, have rights. And I, w I was so excited because I'm definitely, you know, not, I'm, I'm not optimistic about how things are going. All those wonderful acts you referred to in the beginning of your talk, um, I think would be considered to be almost subversive activities by those that are ruling us, um, our electoral you know, um, rulers right now. So I'd like you to just say a few more words about that so I can get that a little bit more clear in my head because I've only seen the negative side and I think you gave us reason to hope that there might be a positive side to that. Um. So around, uh, so there is such incredible work happening out in this world, right? So I just, the, the worker cooperatives shifting, uh, helping shift the racial wealth gap. You know, we know in Chicago, right, the average wealth of an African-American household is something like $40 and $30,000 for the average white family. Like, how can we move forward as a country? With, with these incredible disparities. So there's work going on in that realm. And so the rights of nature mm, is, is not, it's not, one might see it in that way, is to, um, to check corporate power if that was the question. But at the core of it is just saying that, that nature has standing. And uh, in many ways, um, mm, providing, given their ability to stand up in court, Right? and say the rights that I have are the same are, are need to be judged with the rights of you as a corporation and let the courts decide. And you know, these courts are man-made institutions right? with a built-in bias of 300 years old. So 
it's, it's going to be a little bit longer road, road but it, it starts leveling the playing field. It starts leveling the playing field a little bit. Um, and I think it's interesting when you think about the rights of nature, but we are nature, right? Let's not forget that nature's not something out there. We actually have, you can't see it, right? We have microbes all over our skin. COVID-19 has probably made some of us a little bit more aware of that, right? We're a living, seething mass of different organisms in this room. Right? And so we are nature. So it, it, at one level, it seems kind of strange that now we're asking for rights of nature. Right? Um, but, but, um, but there is something powerful about this movement that has clearly captured uh, the imagination of sort of the legal world. And interestingly, the United Nations uh, a number of years ago to call, declared the, uh, Earth Day Mother Earth Day. Right? Mother Earth Day. And once you start using and putting the language of life into these concepts, I think it starts changing how we think of it. Right? So I don't know if that answered your question, but the rights of nature movement, in a way, kind of checks corporate power if one assumes that all corporations are out there to externalize the ecological costs. And clearly many are, but not all do. Hi, two quick questions. Um, one, do you believe that the lack of connection that young people have today has an effect on allergy and the amount of allergies that we're seeing in the population? And two, do you believe that there's still a place for hunters in this? Um, so the first one, I'm not, you know, I'm not a clinician, but the research shows that the more social connection you have, the less apt you are to, um, you, um, you're less prone, uh, you, you have less severity, severity of symptoms, right? And, um, and you tend to catch uh, disease. It's, it's your sort of your, your, your stress response, but I think the allergies might be a little bit something bigger, uh, something bigger, but clearly social connection is something that's really, really vitally important to our overall health and well-being. That is clear, that the, the, the literature is clear about that. And with respect to hunters, um, hunting, Hunting, um, absolutely, but I think it, there's a difference. I've always been curious, this is, this is a me speaking, right? Um, that why we, we want to uh, take pictures of what, we've, what, what hunters have killed, right? And so it's a question I think of honoring, right? So how do we honor, if we're deer hunting, how do we honor the life that has been taken and the gift, right? Let the gift, life that's been gifted us. And that's different than, I think, putting images of, of, of what you shot and sharing it on Facebook. For me, that's different. So it's a question of the honoring, right? We do have to live and, and eat food, right? So whether you're eating meat from an industrial cave, you know, that's been raised in the cave or hunting yourself, I think there's a lot more value almost in, in catching and hunting your own food because you start to understand and reconnect what it actually means to actually take a life and, and and honor that life and that gift. So absolutely. Thank you. Hi there. To my understanding, um, you are the coordinator behind the Beg and Duluth campaign, correct? That's right. Awesome. So I have a question for you regarding that. And this will be a bit of a controversial question. And that's also why I wrote it down. So allow me to ask you. Yeah. How would you respond to claims that the environmental benefit of a bank is dominated by the resource use and production stages, not the waste stage? For example, paper bags take up more room in landfills and contribute far more CO2 to the atmosphere than plastic, whereas reusable cotton bags require heavy use of water and pesticides. What do you think about this and what should be done about this? So, so I agree. I don't disagree with what you're saying. So the bagging campaign was the goal was in shifting to a culture of reuse. Right? So we were advocating for a fee on paper and plastic bags because we know that when people use fees, you see a 70 to 80 to 85% decrease in single bag use. The city council decided not to implement the paper bag fee. So it also de so it depends on what you're looking at. So paper has a much higher climate foot carbon footprint and as implemented by the city council, many people are gonna to shift to, to paper bags. Right? 
And so, so it also depends on time scale. So what you're saying for me isn't controversial. It's, it's, it's been central to our work. Uh, the campaign was never an anti-plastic campaign. It was moving from a culture of single use to reuse. And, and the state of Minnesota and, and almost, we all use the broad um, waste hierarchy, which says, you know, re redesign, reduce, reuse, recycle as, as the last result. Does that, does that help? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thanks. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, um, like, what is your feeling or idea of the separation between indigenous movements for nature's rights and more mainstream and white, like, creative movements for nature's rights? Because I feel like there's been disconnect between the work that indigenous people have been trying to do for their whole lives, like built and embedded into their cultures, versus what we're trying to do as a new jump on board mainstream thing. Hmm. Like I understand the importance of this mainstreaming because it is such a big deal now, but I want to know how we change the way that indigenous people are considered in the justice movement for nature and for indigenous people because indigenous people still have fewer rights than most of the other groups. Um, so, so you, you, there's a lot woven in there, right? And so, and so a friend of mine says, um, who's indigenous, says that we're all indigenous, like we're all indigenous once. And so what I was, what I was um, trying to get across is that we're having to reconnect to what it means to be fully alive on a, human, on, on, on a living planet, which means valuing and honoring the sacred. So I don't know if valuing and honoring the sacred and honoring and reconnecting with all life is owned by anyone. And, and I can appreciate um, that if you're an indigenous person, right, and those are the values that you are living, that, um, that it may seem like a taking, right? right? Um, yet yet um, I am hoping that if we honor the fact that this is ancient, ancient wisdom, right, that it's collectively shared and owned, so it's it's honoring, right? It's honoring, mm, it's honoring um, the wisdom that has been kept and held uh, by indigenous communities, but that that it's deep in all of our DNA, right? And so that it's owned by everyone. So I think it's again, it's sort of in the honoring, and I'd offer that mm, maybe it was the language that I heard, but maybe not what you said. Um, so I just want to be clear about that, is that um, it had suggested like this is kind of a fad, the latest thing, right? And I don't, I don't think it is because like quite honestly, who knows where we as a human species are gonna be in, in 12 or 15 years, we don't know. So it's a calling, it's, it's a deep calling. It's like our DNA, in my mind, our DNA is finally awakening, right? Um, and, and I recognize that for many, it may feel like just a taking. Um, and I hope that in our hearts we can see that there's a reconnecting, a deep reconnecting that is long, long overdue. Is that? Yeah. But thank you for the question. Hi. Um, I have a question and it may be more a semantic question. I'm curious as to why you described the indigenous healthcare system as innovative when it is the indigenous culture, when it is the original, as someone that grew up in indigenous culture, that was the values I was raised with. And I'm not sure that innovative may be the best word for it, if it's a return to cultural roots. Um, I was just wondering if you could say something on that. Sure, um, thanks for pointing out the word innovative. Um, and. Um, I think the innovation is that it's a melding of old and new, right? So there's, it's, it's, it's not just old, 
old medicines, right? So there are traditional healers as part of this, and there are MRIs, and, and it's a melding. But what's uh, innovative is for Western medicine and going to see it, who are used to the biomedical model and seeing the tremendous changes in health outcomes that this model, which is based on relationship, is having. So it's innovative for, I think, those that are, that are maybe outside of, of the sort of really holistic. If you look at the, uh, the medicine wheel, right, or um, the well-being models that are now popping up in different healthcare systems, these are the same models. They just have different colors, and there's probably a lot, <coughs> and, there, and there is a lot deeper, richer meaning in, in the traditional uh, in the indigenous medicine wheels, but I think the word innovative, I didn't, I didn't notice it, so thanks for pointing it out. But I think w w what is exciting is that it's within, within, within the whole indigenous health system, right? They are all been imposed, um, Western biomedical model approaches, and this is a melding of the two. So it's innovative in that way, but, um, but, but practices there. Are, uh, practices that have been around for centuries and centuries and centuries, and they're not innovative. They're just um, good medicine that's uh, being remembered. Yeah. <clears throat> How would you advise integrating this mindset into our culture and sharing this knowledge with other people without coming off as you're forcing your views onto someone else? So can you can you say a little bit more? Um, so like taking this knowledge and sharing it with others without being offensive about it, <laughs> with those who may disagree with the rights of nature. Can you can you just like I'm going to keep teasing you like so the, with the radical nature is what you said or like can you be can you, about the frameworks or how our minds think or is that what you mean or? Yeah, and just overall the rights of nature. And Right. What you would explain. So I, I think it's about having a conversation and not forcing a conversation. It could be, huh, wow, I saw this presentation on the rights of nature. That was pretty, it sort of stimulated me. What do you think? Right? And so it's about helping people um, and it's about deep listening. Right? So um, this may not appeal to everyone. Right? Like clearly it threatens, it threatens like Integrative medicine threatens mainstream medicine. They feel scared by it, right? When women were protesting to get the right to vote, people were scared. It was upsetting the, the civil order of things, right? And so I think um, it's about um, just deep listening and recognizing that, that sometimes people take, take some time to, to listen, but facts, facts don't matter. Facts don't matter, it's the frame, and people have to be ready, and not everyone's always ready. I don't know if that helps. I wish there was a secret sauce. So I figured you had to be a little bit good. I have cancer, and I've been told that it's uh, palliative, not cur uh, curable. And I'm okay with that. I'm told by oncologists that, um, you know, I'm pushing 70. Well, I'm, no, I'm after 70. But when he told it, when he said it to me, I said, well, you know, you get to be close to 70, and you get told that you have two months to 15 years, so what's the big deal? <laughs> I wanted you to know that I thank my trees every morning when I walk out and get my paper. I go, thank you, thank you, thank you. Last fall, I came home from a meeting at a 
I came home from a treatment at the cancer center, and I was feeling kind of self-pitying, and I don't like that feeling at all. And I got stuck in traffic. I live on the Maple Grove Road. And from on Maple Grove Road in Herman, Herman Town last fall, from the Haynes Road to the Midway Road, construction. Now, I used my self-pity to uh, pick up some chocolate talenti, which I'm not supposed to have. And it was melting on my front seat. And I was the first person in the road to get stopped a couple of blocks from my house. And I'm still complaining. I'm watching that talenti melt. And I pull into my yard, stop at the end of the driveway to pick up my mail. I look over, and there's this little maple tree that I purchased as a seedling had grown into this fantastic, beautiful, wonderful, glorious red ball of fire. And I said, oh, thank you, God. Thank you. And then I had this idea. I said to myself, if everybody, because I know I'm not the only person to have cancer, and I thought if everybody on the Maple Grove Road planted a tree, if everybody that was affected by cancer purchased a tree, a legacy tree, and planted it in honor or encouragement or in memory of someone affected with cancer, we'd have a glorious five-mile stretch of beautiful road. Well, I didn't tell anybody about that one for a few months. And then I went to City Hall about a month ago. Well, got to start somewhere, right? So I went to Hermantown City Hall, and you know what? They liked the idea. So we're working on it. We're actually working on getting trees on Maple Grove Road back red maples, wow. and you'll hear more about that. I'll probably let Nancy know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful to hear this story, so when we see that, we'll, we know that there is a signal, right? A message that comes, comes to us in mysterious ways. The yes. world works in mysterious ways. So tonight, was an, tonight was an encouragement, okay. so thank, thank you. Thank you for that story. for that appreciation, thank you, and I come from New Zealand um, in appreciation of your message, it's one that Tangata Whenua Indigenous Peoples spent decades and generations working to have heard. My father was one of the advocates who worked with the people of the Whanganui River, and when he began that work, he faced opprobrium and harsh reaction. But as he took his final breaths, um, he knew that some of the things he'd fought for were going to come to pass. And indeed, it is that work of the heart and reconnective work and honouring that you have spoken of tonight. When six days ago, I took our students on the Hekua New Zealand program to the Honganui River Tribal Office, one of the masters what to take back to the States about our rivers. And Julie Hitter, when he said that the New Zealand legal system is very different from here, um, but there is a Waitangi Tribunal of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I constantly urge people from here to set up such a commission so these heart stories can be heard and more healing can occur. And I know, Professor Morgan, thank you for the kind of work you do to encourage that. And Julie also said, work with the system you currently have, but don't lose sight of the fundamental values you know and live by. Every system is different, but many of those indigenous movements and reconnected trends know what is important in the heart is at the core of action. And my colleague Peter said, it's virtually meaningless to have a legal title without a lived relationship. So again, just a, a note of hope and um, of gratitude.
you. Um, two things. First, a quick question. I, if you could clarify, um, one of the students brought up the question about paper bags versus plastic. And so I need a clarification. Are we saying that paper bags cause more pollution than plastic? So, so it depends what type of pollution you're asking about. So it always the answer always kind of depends, but the overall the overall strategy in in much of this is following around solid waste is moving uh, towards uh, up the hierarchy, moving towards uh, reuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And so so paper bags have a higher c carbon footprint, right? So their production creates more climate gases. Plastic sits in our trees and contaminates the web of life with plastic particles, right? And it has a toxic footprint that is different. So it, the, the toxicity of many of the chemicals used in plastic production is different than paper. So you're comparing apples and oranges. So I'd offer that it's, it's uh, worthy to think not about whether an apple's better than an orange, but how, how we start mo moving upstream and just re reusing, right? Which is, had been the goal of it. But it's, it's, does that yes. so, muddy, the, clear, m yes. m more m yes. muddier? Or more, yes. okay. Thank you. So the solution is reuse. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, and so then I just, lastly, I just wanted to put a shout out or an idea, like, would it be helpful if everyone in this room, excuse me, maybe just wrote their legislators about this talk tonight and our concern I mean, would that, do you think, would be effective? From the elected officials that I know, they always say that handwritten letters are really effective, so I think it kind of depends what you want. Um, people are, can be motivated by this presentation in different ways, right? And so I'd offer that people follow their hearts, right? And if writing a letter is one the way that feels good and right, I think it's, it's sometimes often less the letter, but the energy that you're putting into the world, right? By, taking that, making that act. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm, thank you for staying because um, we have one more thing to do, or really Jamie does, and some students. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to thank you again all for coming. After this last little activity, you're all welcome to come into the uh, lobby. Jamie doesn't have any books to sell this time, but he has time to chat with you about these and other issues. Again, thank you all very much for coming. Jamie, you got it. So, thank you, Tom. So this will just take three minutes or so, and I'd ask some of the students who we met with before, where are you, if you could come up to the mics. Are you ready? Anna and Karen and, and um, so, so, what what you're going to uh, what we're going to experience is an invocation, a, a gratitude, and there is a project that I've sort of put together that I call the One Sacred Earth Project. So you can go to the website onesacredearth.org, and basically it's a crowdsourcing. It's crowdsourcing for gratitudes, and I ask I'm asking anyone who wants to participate to share um, what they are grateful for, what gifts of nature they are grateful for and how do they tend that relationship. And so we've done a little bit of a soft lunch. Um, we've done it at our, at our uh, dinner table for Thanksgiving. We've done it uh, with, with some students at Marshall School. We've done it with a professor in his class at Lake Superior College. And Dr. Morgan uh, invited his students to participate in, in, uh, in this exercise. And I would offer that it would be really exciting if the entire CSS campus or the city of Duluth created a collective invocation of gratitude. What would that look like? What if we did that instead of saying the Pledge of Allegiance or in addition to the Pledge of Allegiance at a city council meeting? So here you go, here's, here's the experience and thank you for the students of CSS. And just to be clear, the way it worked is these submissions came in, I melded them, the words a little bit, so some of the words that you'll, you'll hear are what the students submitted. Sometimes I sort of massaged them just a little bit so it felt a little bit more flowy. 
Um, and so it is one version, it is one version, and if any of the students massage them in their own way, um, they, would, um, they might come up with a slightly different version, but I think collectively it's the energy uh, within the words and, and, and this poetry um, that they have uh, collectively uh, written um, uh, that you'll be hearing. So, all right, let's... Um, I am grateful for the nature that surrounds us and the gift of clean air that it provides. I am grateful for lakes and rivers and moving bodies of water. The water calms me, washes me, soothing my everyday worries, cleansing me. I give thanks to the desert's hot sand and the beautiful mountains. The hot sand reminds me of home and childhood memories. The mountains make me feel like I can achieve anything. I am grateful for the trees, for the oxygen that gives me life, their new beauty in the spring, the cooling shade in the summer, and the colors in the fall. I am grateful for the presence of the trees. The trees sustain me, gifting me clean air to breathe and a place to rest underneath. I flourish in the presence of the blue beauty of the trees as they help remind me of the awe that I feel surrounded by the beauty of the natural world. I am thankful for the peace and exhilaration that nature brings. I feel grateful for the beauty that calms me, the expansiveness that reminds me of the insignificance of my worries. I am grateful for the birds, the trees, all bodies of water, sitting in the middle of the woods while listening to the sounds of birds and splashing of water on rock makes me feel grounded, like I'm connected with the earth. I am grateful for the small streams and the serene sounds of the gently flowing waters. The sound and beauty put my soul and mind at ease. I am grateful for the rivers of Jay Cook and for the natural terrain shaped over millions of years. They fill me with awe and makes me feel connected to the earth. It's peaceful, I am alone with my thoughts, and there's a sense of belonging. I am grateful for the trees and the birds, the setting sun and the water. I am grateful for these gifts because they give me life, they renew me. I am grateful for the beautiful waterfalls and the ones hidden in small untouched areas. I feel a sense of flow and wonder at such natural beauty. It has made me curious of all living things that need water to survive and how the water moves and reflects the sun. I am grateful for the oceans, lakes, rivers, and streams. Being near the water makes me feel at peace. I am grateful for nature and the sense of freedom and happiness it provides. I am grateful for all the critters around me as their special beauty and uniqueness nourish my wonder. I'm grateful for, for Lake Superior, for our awesome views, and the reminder that there is always something unseen. I'm grateful for water, for the beauty of water bodies, for the refreshing, life-giving nourishment water gives our bodies and all life on Earth. I'm grateful for the breathtakingly beautiful color, sounds, and smells of the outdoors. I'm thankful for the refreshing gift of humility, the sense that I am not the center of the world, that I actually mean very little in our self-centered world. I'm grateful for the expansive depths of the seas, skies, and mountains. They humble me. Their greatness and beauty allows me to appreciate my smallness within the love and power of the world. I am grateful for the rain, light drizzle, heavy downpour, sun showers, thunderstorms. The rain humbles me. I am grateful for the diversity of all life, the chickadees on winter days to the beetles in the summer. We are who we are because of the natural world. Without it, I don't even know who or where I'd be. I give thanks to not having food whenever I need it and nature all around me. They have restored my health, giving me a sense of peace that was absent. For these, we give thanks.